Okay, well, uh, it's good to have Richard and Faith Annan here. And the place I first met him was at his house. When you travel from Accra to Cape Coast, it's a great place to stop to use the bathroom. <laughs> What's that? And drink coffee. And drink coffee. Yes. So, um, Richard and Faith uh, were at our house a couple weeks ago, and we got to talking and said, we ought to have you come here and share your story. So that's what they're here to do. They are uh, missionaries with Fields of Hope between Accra and Cape Coast in Africa. I don't know what the town name is, but it doesn't matter. And they, uh, they'll tell you more about what they're doing there. They have three daughters with them, and we look forward to hearing from them. And we, uh, we've been blessed already. Richard was in the Sunday school class sharing with us. So. God, we just thank you for Richard and Faith and their daughters that they can be with us today. God, thank you that no matter where we are in the world, as believers, we have a brotherhood together, a sisterhood together, and we thank you for that. May you anoint Richard again as he shares, um, God, that we could be drawn closer to you, that your kingdom could be furthered, and may you um, guide us as we listen to what he has to share. Thank you for your Holy Spirit here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Good morning. morning. How you all doing? Well, um, something is wrong with my computer here. Good. It's my computer. Oh. Oh. Yeah, this this smart stuff, I don't know if they're really smart or Hello? Hello? Okay, I'll, I'll get it figured out. Hello? I'm from Ghana. Good morning again. Good morning. I wonder if I should just use my voice. This is this Thank you, young man, but I think I'll use my voice, okay? I'm young and energetic. Okay. okay, let's try this clicker thing one more time. Oh, it works. Good. Okay, so like I said, my name is Richard Annan from Ghana, West Africa. We're here to share with you what we do in Ghana. Um, a couple years ago, I moved over here, uh, got married, and worked here as an electrician. Can you believe that in the cold? electrician for seven years and then moved back to Ghana. Uh, why did I move back? I'll tell you why. 
I love America so much. I love Shady Maple. <laughs> but we have to move back. And I'll tell you why we move back. Can we have, can my girls come up? Let's do a song quick, and then we can go from there. Can Deborah and Shalom and Anne Marie come up? So this is us. Deborah is our oldest. She's nine years old. She's tall. I don't know what she's been eating. And then Shalom is seven. And then Anne Marie is the last one. She's the COVID baby. We came here 2020 to have her, and then we got, we got stuck. I teased my wife I should have called her COVID or called her vaccine or something like that. We're going to do a song. Um, we will try and we drove, we came from Africa. I mean, this morning people are still sleepy, so it might be a little bit sleepy, but we'll do it. Right? Do you want to start that? not a singing family. Uh, we don't sing the best, but hey, we, we try. We try. So yeah, we have three girls, and you just saw them. Some beautiful. Thank you, girls. So, I want to give a background a little bit, our story when we moved to Ghana. You can read along. I'll try and make it brief. So, we, as missionaries, we, um, me and my wife moved to Ghana, in 2019 to become missionaries there. But before that, as I said, we lived here. My wife's parents were missionary in Ghana in the year 20, uh, 1997 to 203. That's a long time ago. I was a young boy on the street, doing my own thing, busy. I didn't have my parents to take care of me or tell me what to do. And they came in and they loved me and they cared for me and they said, you, we're going to invest in your life. And they prayed with me and they Discipline me, and sometimes I don't like it, but today I'm so thankful they did that. So my wife's parents took me in, and I always teased them. I said, if you knew I was going to marry your daughter, you'd have invested more in me. <laughs> and uh, also say, I used to be a son, but now I've, I've been promoted to become a son-in-law. So they're there, and, you know, they came, stayed there for seven years. All that, they came back to America, and... Me and Faith stayed in touch, and then we got married um, 2012 after I, after I came back to, after I came here to America. So why do we move to Ghana? I've always wanted to go back and look for people like me, Richard, because if those missionaries from Africa didn't come, they are, from, they are with Charity African Mission, the charity church in the Africa building. If they didn't come to Ghana and find me, invested in me, pray for me, show me a different way. I wouldn't have been here today. I'd have ended up in jail. I'd be doing drugs. I'd probably dead by now. So I always wanted to. I could have stayed here in America, had a good job, you know, live well, go to Shady Maple, all that, drink coffee, and then what? I would die and that's it. Or I can move to Ghana, impact life, give them Christ, raise this young man, 
direct them to Christ and use my life and as a testimony and example. And I can still drink coffee. <laughs> I come to Shady Maple once a year. Amen. So that's our story. That's our background story a little bit. So when we lived there, we lived in Ephrata, and I worked with uh, DS Backholder. It's a small Mennonite company. It's an electrician and all that. And then we moved back. And then, so we work with Force of Hope. How do we meet them? This group of people, different people lived in Ghana with uh, either Gospel Express or Crusade for Christ or different people, and they have the land. The last missionary was there. Moved four years ago. The land is sitting. You know, everything is just chaotic. There's nobody taking care of it. And I always want to go back. So they heard my story. They're like, hey, do you want to go and run the farm for us? And what do we do? So we take, so the area where we are, the tribe is interesting. When you have a child, it belongs to the woman. So the men are not responsible. Because they are like, after all, when you make money, it goes to the woman. So there's young people on their own, like from 8, 9, 10. They have, you know, they are thinking of themselves. So there's a bunch of men, bunch of young boys who are on their own. So what first of all we do is to bring these boys together, give them Christ, mentor them, uh, teach them work ethics, teach them how to save, how to invest, and then be the bridge between them and their future. So if they want to go learn a trade, or want to go to school, or want to do something, we help them get to that place. Because we believe, and that's my thing, if somebody didn't invest in me, I'll not be here speaking today. I might be dead in my grave, or I might be in jail, because I was going the wrong path. And um, so that's what Fools of Hope will do. We'll go back, uh, we go and then ra- bring these kids, boys together, keep them on the farm, they work, we save their money, and then help them go to school or learn a trade and have a skill, become better people. So within the, uh, normally we have, within a year we have between 15 to 25 boys come through the farm. And they will do like a year to two years. If you're good, you want to do more, we'll give you two years. If you think you're trouble, we'll give you a year. And we had a lot of trouble people. There's a lot of trouble people like me growing up. And I see these boys, it reminds me of myself. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I've been there before. I know what you're doing. And my wife sometimes would tell me, give them grace. Give them, I remember when my dad used to deal with you and things like that. You know, I'm like, oh, don't bring it up, you know. <laughs> but it's so rewarding to see myself in these boys. And also they come very bitter, very upset, upset with the whole world, and then they live so nice and gentle, and they have somewhere they are going. And that gives me joy. So even though I miss Shady Maple, I will still go back to Ghana and do what I do. Okay. So we've had some, a lot of success stories. Some didn't go well. Some will come in three months, four months, they will go. Some will come and we're doing very well. So let me share a little bit of some of our success stories. So we have this guy called Emmanuel. He finished high school, good grades, but come from a very poor home. And he, okay, come work on the farm, save the money, we'll help you go to the university. So he's going to, he's an electrician, he studied electrical engineering. Doing very well, we're excited for him, for his future. There was Evans, came to us, came from a home that he has epilepsy and they think it's a, it's a curse. So whenever it comes, they'll go and do all these rituals. So I said, no, we're going to pray for you. Whenever it's on the farm, it came a couple times, but then we pray and then he's doing very well. He started electrical school. He wants to become an electrician. Then we have Mishak, who stayed with us for years. When we found him, he was staying in an abandoned vehicle, wanting to become a mechanic. And so we brought him in and he worked with us and then we took him to this uh, a Mennonite training center in Cape Coast uh, run by Kenny Zizet is with um, Christian Aid Ministry. We took him there. He learned how to do mechanic work and he's on his own. You know, that's a success story. So we had, when we first started about four years ago, we had three boys come to us. So there is Peter 1, Peter 2, and Peter. They all call Peter. They are from the same village. So we named them Peter 1, Peter 2, Peter 3. But Peter 2 and 3 gave me so much trouble they couldn't finish. They left. But Peter 1 stuck to it and glory to God, he's going to a boutique. He won't become a builder. Just last year, he told me, he said, one day I'll become a contractor and help build houses for the mission. And to me, that was so fulfilling. I was like, wow. He's already thinking to give back to the mission that helped him. I'm excited about that. And we have Sammy. Sammy is, um, um, is an orphan. Uh, he lost both of his parents. And in Africa, who have been, you, those who have been there, there's no opportunities like, you know, uh, um, soup kitchens and churches coming to your aid and all that. No, you're on your own. And we found him very nice boy. He wants to do something with his life. He actually stays with us now. He's like my right-hand man and we are monitoring him to become 
part of the source of hope in the future. Mariama, we found her at a restaurant. She, um, she was nice with our girls and we talked to her. One day we went back and she said, I'm quitting my job. I said, why? Well, she said, the boss wants to abuse me, wants to take advantage of me and all that. I'm going to quit. Good Christian girl, very, very focused, want to serve God every angle. She said, I can't do this. I, it's against my Christian belief. And we said, we will try and see if we can help you. So come stay with us and help us with the girls. And after a year, we can help you do what you want to do. She said, I want to become a nurse. And we don't, you know, we're living on a budget. How are we going to help you? But I told my wife, I said, let's step out in faith. We're going to take her to school. And by God's grace, she's, she has one year to finish. She's become a nurse. And she told us, this. she said, when I finish, I would set up a hospital, a clinic for disabled kids and women. I'm going to volunteer my time to help people. It's amazing to see, you know, it's becoming a ripple effect. Like I said, I could stay here, make a lot of money, go to Shady Maple once a week, and then what? You know, or I can go to Ghana, be there, enjoy, have fun, and still drink coffee and change lives for Christ. Anyway, so this is some of our success stories. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of them I'm not even talking about. There's, there's a lot, lot of them. So last year, 2022, we had about 25 young men uh, that lived with us, came through the program and all that. This is some of them. We went to a church in Accra, and um, it's amazing. I'm looking at some of them now, um, where they are, where they are going in the future, and I'm excited. It gives me joy. So the farm... What do we do? We're producing our own stuff now. We have our own cayenne pepper. We brought some. We do our own peanuts. We have our own uh, corn. Uh, we're feeding ourselves on the farm so that we, we are not waiting for people to send money from America before they start eating. You know, they, the mission support all the feeding and all their stuff. But if we can also plant our own cassava and stuff, that is going to help. And we can build more dormitories and have more boys so we can mentor more people. So we do our condo and we have our gari. Gari is like the mashed potato of Ghana. Everybody eats it. It's a quick food. And then we do our red pepper, like I said, the peanuts and then some kind of flour stuff. Um, and God has been very gracious to us. Uh, people, I remember somebody came to me the first day and said, did you bring some kind of chemicals from America to spray your corn? I said, no. He said, your corn so looks so beautiful. I said, we pray for our corn before we plant them. And God is blessing this farm. And, you know, and it's amazing if the neighbors uh, are seeing the hand of God in what we're doing over there. Pastor David and his family. So we met this guy. His name is Pastor David. A very strong Christian man. We hired him last year to be part of it. Helped me with some of the spiritual stuff we do because I, um, um, he's been a pastor for years. And we deal with a lot of these boys come from very, very dark families like demonic homes and stuff and they come with a lot of burdens and I alone can do it. I get beaten sometimes and I I, you know, I got sick for two years. Everybody thought I'm going to die. People had dreams that I'm dead and all that um, because you think that that was going to smile at us and say, oh good boy, you left Lancaster, came to Ghana trying to change life. No, he's going to fight because we're, we are stepping into his territory you know, we're changing this boy's life they are loving Christ, they are praying, they are singing they are changing their destiny, they are changing the, the curses of their fathers are not on them anymore. The devil's not going to smile at us so he hit us hard and he hit me with typhoid, it's called um, something to do with my gut and even when I drink coffee I feel pain, when I drink water I feel pain, I still drink coffee, I don't care <laughs> and um, I got sick two years ago for the last two years um, I was bedridden they carried me, give me a shower all that, Pastor David and my wife helped me and just, just from November I started getting better I didn't even know I'd make it to the state this year but we're here, so we praise God for that see, the devil, somebody said it's like a, a toothless bulldog he will scare you, he will back you do all kinds of stuff, but he can't bite you he can't kill you, like Job in the Bible he lost everything. But what happened at the end? And that's how we feel God is doing with our lives in Ghana right now. The devil hit us very hard. Hit us so hard that people doubted, did God really call you to come to Ghana or you just said it yourself? But anyway, Pastor David is a, a nice Christian man, him and his family. He brings people from all over Ghana, like what we're doing. So we hired him and he's helping us with all the stuff. We hired, and his name is, her name is Happy. She cooked for the boys, and that's the, the husband and the son, Emmanuel and Felix. At this moment, I'm going to 
let my wife come up and talk about a few things. Um, she likes sharing these things, and I think she can explain it better and speak good English for you to understand. Let's clap for my dear wife. She's been a good support. All right. Well, thank you guys for having us this morning. It's an honor to be here. And um, I'm going to just share, first of all, a young man's story. This is one of our boys. His name is Isaac. And um, in Ghana, along the Volta River, there is a... Um, should I stand more in front of the mic? Sorry. Um, there's a place where they enslave children to do fishing. And so these, they'll go to poor families and tell them, oh, your children, we'll, we'll give them an education, we'll take care of them, they'll work for a few hours on the fishing boats, and, you know, and then when they're, old, you know, when they're done with school, we'll send them back to you and that. Well, it's not like that. These children are working 14, 15 hours a day, they're given sometimes only one meal a day. Um, of course, they're not given any love or care. Um, and anyway, Isaac, we were out. We took the boys to the beach one day, and, um, and we were all swimming. And I noticed one of the boys way far out in the ocean. And I said something to the other boys. I'm like, what? what? Who's out there? And they're like, oh, it's Isaac. I said, well, he shouldn't be out there by himself. They're like, oh, he's fine. He's from that Volta Lake place. He was there for so many years. He knows how to swim. So anyway, that's when I got to know that he was enslaved there as a child from the age of three. Um, he and some of his brothers were taken from their family and brought to this place, and they had to work 14 hours a day on the boats. Um, he was only three years old. I mean, my littlest is almost three, and I think of that. You know, he grew up with no love from a mother, no care. And <clears throat> he was telling me his story, and he was just crying, and he said, he, he calls me Mama, and he said, Mama, we, we suffered. He said, we didn't have food to eat, and we suffered, and, and it just broke my heart to, to see what, you know, he's gone through. And, and, you know, all of our boys, they have a story, but, you know, this, his story stood out. And um, anyway, he finally escaped when he was 12, <coughs> He's now 22, and he, he had no education up until the time he was 12 because um, he was in this slavery, and so he had no education. But when he got out, his brother helped him, and he now has finished high school, and he's writing some of his final exams now. And um, he's been working on the farm and saving money to help, help him um, to further his education. He's very good in math, and so he would like to become an accountant and so that's his goal, is to, to finish school and become an accountant. So that's Isaac's story. Um, as, <coughs> as my um, husband mentioned, 2022 was a very difficult year for us. Um, looking back, we are thankful for all that we went through. It was not easy, but God brought us through. Um, this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, um, 8, it was a constant constantly on my mind during this time is that we are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed we are perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed so it was like one thing right after another for us this past year and like my husband shared a bit um you know satan's not happy when we tread on his territory and where we are in ghana it's a very dark place spiritually. Um, in our region where we are, it's the highest um, rate of teen pregnancy and the highest rate of, of abortion in, um, in Ghana. And, um, you know, Satan doesn't want to see us go there and help people. He doesn't want to see us, um, he doesn't want to see these children's lives turning around and becoming better. And so he hit us hard this year. And, but, God was with us through that we were not crushed. We were not in despair. We were not forsaken. We were not destroyed. And we're so thankful for what God brought us through. So my husband mentioned his sickness. Um, he was sick for a good year and a half, going on two years. Um, and I'm going to show some pictures here. Um, they're a little disturbing. So... <laughs> um, 
but we're thankful for how far God brought us. So the first picture there is Richard before he was sick. He was quite healthy, tough, full, <laughs> chubby. Um, and then the middle picture in, in his bed there, that was in June of this past year. And he had, bas he had lost tons of weight. And the typhoid had just totally ruined his body. I mean, I had noticed for a few months before we realized he was even, he noticed he was losing strength, he didn't have appetite, like we knew something was wrong, we didn't know what. But I had noticed like muscle strength getting lost in his shoulders, and I kept saying, your shoulders, they look like an old man, like you're looking, you know. So anyway, finally he got some blood work done and found out he had typhoid fever and um, treated it. It just never really went away. It was um, just a battle, you know, trying to to uh, fight this thing. So in the end of June, he ended up, end of June, early July, he ended up in the hospital for 10 days. Pastor David, who he, he showed a picture of, happened to be with us. God orchestrated all the details, and it would take time for me to explain everything, but God orchestrated all the details that David was with us at the time. We weren't even at home. We had traveled to a different place. Richard became very restless and and just um one night the night we arrived at this place where we were staying um he was very restless and very agitated and I was in, up in the night about one o'clock in the morning rubbing his feet trying to get him to relax and and calm down and and I worked here in Lancaster County for about 10 years in geriatric care and I sat with a lot of people who were dying and there was a smell coming from my husband that reminded me of all those times that I sat with people that were dying. And it was very scary. <laughs> and, um, and then that next morning, I went to David and I said, David, Richard's not good, and I think we need to try to take him to the hospital, or I mean, I don't know, but. Um, so we went into our room and David and I sat with Richard on the bed and Richard was saying, I just wanna die. He said, I'm tired. I've been sick for so long, nothing's working, we've tried to treat everything. He said, I'm done, I just wanna die. And he was so weak at that point, he couldn't walk, and we had to help him get to the shower and get to the hospital. David took him to the hospital, I was with my girls. Um, and so David took him into the hospital, and David stood by his side for 10 days in the hospital, didn't go home to his family, stayed with us it was over two weeks that he was with us because then after Richard was discharged from the hospital we stayed in the area so it was all God's grace that we were even in that area because where we live there's not a good hospital I mean there's there's a hospital but it's not a place I would want my husband to be and but we had happened to travel to this other area and then that's when things really went bad and he ended up in this other hospital where where um Anyway, so during this time in the hospital, the doctors did 36, 38 odd tests on him to try and figure out what was wrong. And it was really his time in the hospital that we realized that this is not a physical thing we're dealing with. This is a spiritual battle. This is something that Satan is trying to put on us because the doctors could find nothing wrong with him. I mean, the man is dying, clearly. I mean, you can see the pictures. He was dying. But physically they could find nothing wrong with him they did 36 or 38 tests you know cat scans and um all all the different tests at first they weren't going to do stuff and because they thought he came in with pastor david and they were thinking well maybe they can't afford this you know all these tests and stuff when i showed up then they realized okay you know the the white ladies there you know then so I told him, I said, I want everything done that you can do to test to figure out what is wrong with him because we've been dealing with this typhoid for, you know, a year, year and a half, and, you know, we need to figure out what's going on. So that's what they started running all the tests. They told, said it wasn't typhoid, it wasn't this. Well, during this time, David's in the hospital with him praying, and David was getting serious spiritual attacks whilst he was in, in prayer for my husband. People back here in the States from our Bible study group and stuff were praying. Some of them were getting serious um, spiritual attacks while praying for him. And, you know, Satan didn't want to let him live because God has good things in store for the, the young people in Ghana because of us being there. And so we're just thankful that God brought us through this. Um, 
It was a long journey. From May to October, Pastor David and, and Sammy, Richard mentioned him, he lives with us. He's a tall boy. He's about six foot five or six foot six tall and about this big around, skinny, skinny little guy. But he calls Richard and I dad and mom because he doesn't have parents, Richard had mentioned. Um, so he lives with us, helps us around the house, you know, is just there kind of as an extra security. If we're gone, like now, he's there taking care of everything at home. Um, anyway, so him and Pastor David would give Richard these hot water massages two to three times a day just to help him manage the pain he was in. And so um, I'm very thankful for them that they were there with us, that they walked through this with us, that they prayed with us. Um, God really really met us through this so um, that was that was our long term trial in 2022 we also had a lot of other things that happened um, the farm there was a lot of spiritual attacks on the farm so this all this stuff here is juju or witchcraft um, these are pictures of different witchcraft um, so the farm where we where we have the, the farm for the boys, is 78 acres of land. And that land was sold to Fields of Hope Ministries um, back, I don't know, eight, eight, ten years ago or so. Um, the ministry actually paid for the land twice because there was fights between the queen mother and the chief in the village, and they both felt like they were the ones that rightfully owned the land, and so the mission paid for the land twice. There's always been like this kind of dispute and whatever. Legally, all the papers are in Fields of Hope now, owns it legally. Um, so when the missionary that was there before us left, there was about a four-year gap between the time he was there to the time we were there, by the time we came. And during that four-year gap, when there was no missionary there, the chief and the queen mother, they sold off about half of the farmland. So when we got there in 2019, um, Richard went in as a Ghanaian. He was able to go back in there and understanding how these land issues work, he was able to reclaim that land. And so we planted trees along the border. We graded the border and everything. And all those people that the chief and queen mother had sold land to, rightfully what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to give them another portion of land somewhere or pay their money back. So that's how these land disputes are supposed to work. Well, that that village, there's no more land for them to give out. And they don't have um, the money to pay these people back. And so they get a lot of pressure from the townspeople that they're supposed to give this land back and all of this. So because they don't have any more land, they try to, at first when we got there, they were, trying to, they were threatening us, they're gonna take half the land back. And they, you know, different times they did that. The last couple of years, it's kind of calmed down because they knew rightfully, legally, they can't take the land. Um, so, but just this past year, the old queen mother died and a new queen mother was installed. And so now she's getting the pressure. And so she's, they've been trying to put the pressure back on us again. And David was, Richard was sick and David was helping to deal with some of this. And David told them, he said, I'll go, we'll meet in court we'll bring our papers, we'll bring our receipts, we'll meet you guys in court, and we'll settle this thing, you know, once and for all. They didn't want to meet in court. So what they did is they turned to their fetish priests, their witch doctors, their whatever, and started in planting witchcraft on the land. To scare us, I guess, help, hope we run away. They, you know, did these things. When they do these things, some of these um, witch doctors have power, that you know, if they put a curse on somebody, that person will die, and all of this. So they were trying to trying to do this to us. Um, Richard's grandfather actually was a very powerful witch doctor, and um, anyway, I'll I'll go into a little bit of that here in a little bit. But so these were some of the things that they planted on the land. David went as a pastor, and he went and he smashed all that stuff, and he prayed in the name of Jesus over it. We started prayer meetings at the farm every night. We were praying um, that God would surround that farm with his angels, that he would protect that land, that nobody would able to be able to encroach on it, that, um, that they would not be able to you know, take the land because God has 
a special plan for that land. God has a purpose and a plan. That land is where young people's lives are going to be transformed and changed and already are, but, you know, more is to come. So anyway, that's the story of the land. Um, during this time, too, there was another thing that happened is we had a, a dog. Uh, it was a foreign dog, but we had a dog that was um, fully vaccinated for rabies, and um, she suddenly became ill, and we had to put her down. The vet said she had rabies, so we had to put her down. David, it was right around this whole time, and David said that it was all part of the attack, that the, the, the Satan, Satan, he's the one behind all this. I mean, there's people he uses, agents he uses. But Satan wanted one of us to be killed, but God didn't allow that, and he allowed it to go to the animal instead of us. So we're very thankful for God's protection, for his guidance and direction through all of these things. Um, and then in November, early in November, Richard's father passed away, and um, Richard has had a an interesting relationship with his father over the years. His father never took care of him very well. Um, he tried, I guess, in the ways that he knew how. Um, but I've been very proud of Richard over the past four years that we've lived back in Ghana. Richard was convicted by God that God said I should honor my father. And it doesn't matter if my father was good to me or he wasn't good to me. God has commanded me to honor my father. So Richard took every opportunity he could to show honor and respect to his father. And like I said a little bit ago, his, his grandfather was a very powerful witch doctor. Some of that was passed on to his dad. His dad also wanted to pass that on to him. But of course, he's covered by the blood of Jesus and cannot, you know, take those things on. And so there was a spiritual battle going on between him and his father. And we don't understand exactly, but there were some very clear signs that happened. When Richard was in the hospital, his father was in fairly good health. You know, he was old, but he was in fairly good health. When Richard got out of the hospital, his father suddenly became sick and was in bed until the day he died. Um, when he died, Richard's health suddenly changed. So back, if you remember the picture back, there was a picture of Richard in December of 2022. That was just a few months ago. You could see he looked very bad. That was at his dad's funeral. And it was like after the funeral, everything was settled. His health totally turned around. So we don't know how all these things are connected, but we do know that Satan wants his kingdom to thrive. And when you go against that, you're going to face things that are difficult. So anyway, all that to say, David and his prayer team stood behind us the whole time. They would come out. So they live, David lives about an hour and a half away from us in the capital city of Accra. And he, he would bring his team out um, about once a month. They'd spend a couple days out there with us. They'd go to the farm and pray. They'd pray with us at the house. They just spent a lot of time with us in prayer. I'm going to show a few clips of the prayer times together. They're a little different than our normal prayer times here. Um, but um, I think you guys will enjoy this. So this was when Richard was sick. No way. They dedicated their time and energy and spent hours of time in prayer for us. This is another prayer time in our yard. Um, this would have been around the time of the, the witchcraft and stuff being on the land. We were doing nightly prayer meetings either at the house or up at the farm. <coughs> and then this is on our porch one evening. David was just leading us all in prayer.
Okay. So one thing that I think she forgot to mention is that after all these, you know, somebody has to win, right? When there's a battle between two people, somebody's going to win. And guess who won? Christ won. We overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. And yes, it was scary. In the moment when we're fighting this battle, I gave up. You know, I want to die. I want to get done. And but God said, no, you know. And um, after all these, the environment and even the, the attitude and the atmosphere on the farm with the boys change. They, they start loving God. They want to pray more. They want to sing. They want to, they, even the fighting and stuff on the farm change because then there's a new birth. There's something new that happened. And that's what prayer can do. And, you know, I want to... Uh, I want to read this verse. It says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. The devil meant evil against us. It's like, you are my territory. I'm going to whip you. But no, God said, okay. Like Job, yes, you can hurt him, but you can take his soul. And that's what happened. Um, so yeah, that's one of the verses that I really like. And then he said, I love this one. I shared with you this morning. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We don't, you know, it's, it's not just, thank you God for this day, bless us our day. No. It's a warfare. You don't go to war and, and stand there with your sword and stuff and just stand and look out for me. And get distracted. Somebody send you a Facebook message. Oh, let me go through my Facebook message before I, I, I come back to. They will kill you. You will die. And that's what is happening in Africa. If you're a Christian and you don't pray, you don't pray like what we're praying, calling the name of the Lord and using the, the Bible verse, you're going to die. It's not, it's, not, it's not a joke. Same here. Here we treat it different because you know why? The devil has a lot of people like this and rocking them. Give us a lot of shocks. And that's so everything is okay. You know, let's treat it with medication. No. We've been attacked in different ways, different angles, even here in America. And we, we take it, you know, it's a, different, it's a different way. So don't forget this. We don't wrestle with, with, with flesh. Our Christians, we are in a battle. We are at a war. If not, it won't tell us to put all the whole armor of God. The Bible told us, he knows we are at a war. That's why I said, put all the whole armor of God. The word of God is your, your sword. If you put that sword down, you'll be killed so easily, man, I tell you. And we don't want to die. We want to live to declare the goodness of God. We want to live to bring glory and honor. We want to live to bring men and women to Christ. We want our life to impact people. I tell the youth that I, I speak to all the time, I said, if you're not impacting life, if you're not changing life, if you're not transforming life, then you don't have to live in this So You're wasting the time. You're wasting the space. And that's the challenge I want to live with all of you today. Where you work, your family, your wife, your children, your husband, the kids God has blessed you with, are you imparting their lives with the truth? Or you're just playing church? <coughs> There's a war going on, I tell you. There's a big war in America right now. Look at all the stupidness that is going on. Transgender, same-sex marriage, gender, that are all these stupid things. Today I'm gross, tomorrow I'm Joshua, the next day I'm this. Are you stupid? Are you blind? Can't you tell who you are? Do I have to tell you? No, so that's what is happening. Christians are saying, oh, it's okay, we have to love them. Christ is all loving. No, he's all loving, but he's also going to judge us. So there's a war going on in America right now. And Christians are sitting back. The only way we can fight is to pray and use the word. Pray, pray, pray. No, thank you for this meal, amen. No. Pray as a family. Pray, pray with your children. Pray with your husband. Pray with your wife. Pray, pray. That is the only weapon we have. We don't have the media. We, you know, uh, whatever, NBC, whatever. No, Fox News are not behind us, the Christians. They don't care about you. And now it's, it's coming. It's creeping in. You know, Lancaster County, you hear stories of like, whoa, I thought that place is the holy place that we have. But now, you know, it's, it's, it's coming. It's creeping in. And we're sitting down, well, I, don't, I don't want to get involved. I don't, you know, I'm going to love them. Yes, love them, but pray for them. Pray against that demonic spirit that is going to take over. Otherwise, our children are going to suffer, I tell you. 
Our great-grandchildren are going to suffer. Then what's the sense of this heritage God has given to us? A Mennonite background and a Baptist background. How many of you here speak Dutch, Pennsylvania Dutch? How many? Nobody speak Dutch here? So I'm your Schwarza brother. That means I'm your black brother. So in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. There's no black or white or green or whatever. We're all the same people. That's why I care about this. And the heritage you have as men and I people, there's people all over the world who want it. You have good foundation. Nobody held my hand, took me to church when I was growing up. My dad didn't care about that because my, father, my, my grandfather was a witch doctor. He is so powerful. If he wants you to die at 12 a.m., you die at 12 a.m. And here, the youth is standing back on the, this heritage and thinking it's wrong. I'm tired of being men and there's so many rules. There's, you're going to get shot. You're going to die. And we, the leaders of a church, are, oh, let's, you know, let's bring you a little bit of smoke, a little bit of light, just make it nice so that they feel like... They... No, tell them the truth. Let them know the truth. Where they are going, they're going to get die. They're going to get shot because they are playing with fire. It's not... It's not, we're not we were not wrestling with um, flesh and blood. Anyway. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Huh? Okay, that's fine. It's my fault. Um, the only place we could have run, the only place that we, when we went through the, the, what we went through was God. That's the only place. Because nobody can save us. Nobody. I mean, when I decided I want to die, I'm like, all right, I guess that's what God wants me to do. I've done my part. I'm dying. But then my, my pastor friend said, no, you're not dying. <laughs> and he said, you're dying and leaving all these things you started in Ghana. Who is going to finish it? You're going to stay to finish it. Like, wow, hey, I guess I can't die today. <laughs> By the name of the Lord, let's remember that. You, you know, people in the church, the, the youth, the name, when we're struggling with stuff, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. That's the only place we can go to. Currently, when I have an issue, I go to God. I say, God, you know I don't have anybody. I don't come from a rich home. My last name is no, um, uh, what do you call them, Trump or the other people? <laughs> when I need money, God, I need money. When I need food, when I need healing. As I talk to you, I, I have pains. You know, when I talk loud, I feel like somebody's poking me, but I still go and drink coffee because I'm trusting, trusting God for everything. So the name of the Lord is a strong tower. So when you have issues, don't go and, I need counseling. No, pray to God. Go on your knees and ask God, please help me. You are my only help. And he will come. So all this is that we've said. It's, it sounds beautiful. It sounds heavenly, whatever. So there's different pictures, 2021, 20, 22, 19, and all that. We went there, how we started and all that. How can you get involved? How can you get involved? Maybe you can't come to Ghana and pray and pray and pray. No, maybe you can't, you're scared of flying. 12 hours is too much. You have a DC, whatever. You can't sit on the plane for a long time. You can pray for us, please. Pray for me. Pray for me and my wife and my children. You know, we get attacked from different angles. Pray for us, please. Don't, don't. Pray for us. That's the number one thing we need. Pray, think of us. We brought our prayer cards sitting out there. We brought commitment card. Take them, put them on your fridge. When you see this black guy, think of them and pray. Ask, think of, ask, think you, ask yourself, what is he doing this moment? Is he talking to somebody? Is he sleeping? Is he eating? What is he doing? And pray for us, please. We need that prayer. Are we going to pray for us? Let me see hands up who are going to pray for us, please. Let's see. Thank you so much. God bless you. How can you get involved? Pray for us, number one. You can support us financially. When I got sick at the hospital, I stayed there for 10 days. I have to pay my bills. They didn't say, oh, because your wife is American. What they actually said, that because your wife's American, you're going to pay more because she's rich. Oh, my shoes, I want to hide there. Sometimes when we go out, I hide there because... Seeing her alone, everything I pay double because she's American and she's white. So you can, you can support us financially. To live in Ghana peacefully, comfortably for us, we need about $4,000 to live. That includes our plane ticket to come back, our emergency um, fund, our health insurance and all that. 
you can, we have a commitment card that you can commit to it. You know, if you want to give me 4000 every month, God bless you. If you don't give me $2 every month, God bless you. I'll be excited. So you can come in and support us. Um, currently, we are at 2000 a month. So whenever we want to come back, we send email to people and say, hey, can you help us come back to America? Otherwise, we're stuck in Ghana. And my wife is from here. She has to see her parents, and the kids want to see their grandparents. And I'm like, uh. anyway, so please, uh, that's one way you can help us. We need a family van and a van to also help transporting the boys to programs and youth conferences and stuff. And we're looking into some, and it's going to cost $25,000. Dollars. That's a lot of money in Ghana. If you've been led to support us, if you want to buy us a new van, write me a check now. I'll be so happy. But whatever God lives on your heart. And if you don't, still, I still love you. <laughs> okay. One of the things we started doing, we start meeting people like Mariama and different people, good Christian people, but they come from a very poor background and they need help. They want to become nurses and doctors and whatever. College in Africa is not expensive. For three years, it will cost 5000 to send somebody to go to a nursing school. Okay. So all these people like Isaac and Candy and Comfort and uh, Vera and Kofi need money and Jennifer, they need money to go to school so that they can become uh, nurses and accountants and all that. And we need about $150 per month per student. And so it's 1,800 for a year for students and 5,400 for the whole three years of the school. I'm going to leave it up to you. If God is telling you to support, that would be great. I believe in these people. Someday there will be a lot of riches springing out and they're going to stand up and share the gospel because some people like us helped. We donated. We so we're going to we're creating an education fund, and then what is do, we're doing is that we support them to go to school, and then someday they can also come back and also mentor and support other people. And we're going to start all this ripple effect to help other people. All right, we have a lot of fun stuff with our girls. It's not only about all this praying and crying and all the sad stuff. We have some cuties. They love animals, which to me is a little bit. Um, people don't have food to eat, but hey, we, we need to keep our cat, and we need to feed them, we need to do all that. And the girls love it, and I'm happy because, you know, living, moving from America to Ghana, it's, you know, it's not fun for them. So to make them happy, they want to keep their cats, and we always have some animal coming in. So they do some fun stuff, and, you know, these girls are a blessing to have around. And like I said, this our prayer, our prayer card is back there, and our support card, and uh, any way you can help us. Also, if you want to visit us, you are more than welcome. We have a guest room. We'll feed you. We'll give you a place to stay, but you have to buy your own plane ticket. <laughs> I'm looking for some of the young men or the men who can do carpentry or mason, whatever. If you have a skill, you want to volunteer your time a week too, I'll be happy to use you on the farm. We're building all kinds of stuff. Um, the women want to come. My wife wants to start a women ministry. You want to come, whatever, you're more than welcome. Connect with us. We have our, you know, email is there. If you want to get a monthly update, we'll send it to you. We do that. And um, pray for us. If you want to know what is happening with us, uh, an app called WhatsApp is free. You can test us and find, hey, what are you doing today? You know, we'll connect with you. We thank God for the privilege that we have to be here with you today. And it's fun because my grandfather was a witch doctor, and my dad was, eh, I don't know where he is. And today I'm here. Tomorrow, where will my children be? Tomorrow, where will all these people that we share with you be? So please partner with us. Pray for us. Support us. Invest in us. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Richard and Faith. It's so exciting to hear what God is doing through you. And uh, I just uh, would encourage all of us to take that challenge very seriously. That